1741, in a, he, Edwards preached a sermon called Sinners in the Hands of Nairi God in Enfield, Connecticut. Basically, he tried to scare the hell out of people. He never finished the sermon, though, because people were howling and screaming the aisle, saying stuff like, I'm going to hell. What can I do to be saved? They were running up to the pulpit, you know, falling flat, spread eagle on the ground, riling and screaming and just howling as if they were going mad, that they were terrified they're going to hell because, well, they were terrified they're going to hell. What's remarkable is that Edwards is actually such a boring speaker by all accounts. You actually have man shows the sermons. They sound like very dense philosophical, theological lectures more than sermons. I, I think that you and I can barely follow them. And uh, – and, and and you could you could raise such an intense how he could he raise such intense emotion when his delivery style was so awful it was said that he was very nearsighted so he'd like read with his eyes very close to the text reading word for word for word never looking up um, his style was not very compelling um, how you could raise such intense emotions how do we do that well so how do you know that the re revivals are real and not human emotions or satanic influences. Well, he would actually argue that these revivals must be accompanied by long-lasting good works and transformed life. So he'd say, like, it's one thing for you to, like, scream and howl and yell at the moon, you know, in the intense motion. But he would say, does that make you a Christian? Well, no, not really, maybe. But let's just see the long-term effects. Let's check on you in a year from now, two years from now, three years from now. Are you actually living a transformed life? Are you really exhibiting the fruits of the Spirit? Um. It must be accompanied by a real thing. Otherwise, it's just a false revival or you've had a false transformation, a false awakening. Uh, this stance was actually quite liberal and open-minded for Edwards. He was not an emotional man. I mean he was not very personable. He was highly intellectual, very aloof. Think about the most intellectual aloof or uh, un, un, the cold-hearted professor, philosopher, mathematician type. That, that, that was him. I mean, he was probably more comfortable reading books than talking to people. He's probably the sort of guy that would like take the long way around town, just avoid talking to people. He rushing to his library to, uh, to to read books all by himself. And he was dignified and self-controlled. He was very, very aristocratic and uh, probably uptight and stuffy. But while he was preaching, people are rolling in the aisles and screaming, and he was actually okay with that. Again, this is very open-minded and liberal and out of character for Edwards. You'd, see, you'd assume he's the kind of guy that says, stop it, it's all fake, none of it's real. And yet, you know, he, he thought this was something that had to be um, taken seriously, that this might be a good thing. I mean, Edwards never traveled far beyond his Connecticut world. He traveled a little bit in neighboring towns, but not very, very far. Um, a guy named George Whitfield turned the Awakening into a franchise, all the 13 colonies. Edwards kept a local. Whitfield took Edwards' ideas and maybe spread it all over America and possibly beyond America into the world as well. George Whitfield was the opposite of Edwards. While Edwards was bookish, intellectual, and socially awkward, and his preaching style was boring, Whitfield was dramatic and internationally and intentionally so. George Whitfield was a traveling evangelist that traveled up and down the American coast. He grew up in England, and he was an ordained Anglican. He was a Calvinist. Wherever he went, massive numbers of people would watch him preach. Crowds of 5,000 or even 15,000 people were common. Because the numbers were so large, he usually preached outside in an open field. At the time, this was bizarre. The proper place for preaching was in the church. And every time he preached, massive numbers of people would claim that they experienced the new birth for the first time. Why was Whitfield so successful? Well, part of the answer lies in his technique and his youth. Whitfield was a trained actor, and he took his acting and dramatic skills and applied them to preaching. His sermons were dramatic and highly emotional performances, made all the more dramatic when he plays in, contact, in contrast with them, uh, what people are used to. I want you to imagine what I'm going to describe to you as a Puritan, Puritan pastor. And the Puritan pastor is very much similar to the Puritan, uh, the, the average Anglican uh, pastor of the Church of England. Uh, he wore a black robe from neck to feet. He stood perfectly still and talked often in a monotone voice. He probably prepared a text he read just like this. Um, and there was no attempt to be dramatic or flourishing or have, you know, a poetic or to, to, to rise emotions. That was never the goal. These sermons were often uh, a long uh, theological expositions about the nature of depravity, the mysteries of divine sovereignty. He was literally a talking and floating head. Um, and his robe was intentional, you know. So he wore a white wig and a robe. You just see the face. His 
body is um, uh, camouflaged. This distinctness of his hair is camouflaged by the white wig that's uniform for all passers. The idea seems to be that the passer is not a person or individual, but rather you're just a, a, a function of God. So your own personality should be camouflaged. Your body should be covered up for the sake of being anonymous, for the sake of God. When Whitfield preached, though, he – again, he was a trained actor in his youth who then later became a pastor. But it seemed clear that he used his actor um, uh, background, his acting chops to influence the way he preached. And he preached like no one else had preached before. And then again, Edwards was boring, intentionally so. Yet somehow he caused a revival or was used to create a revival. Whitfield was over-the-top dramatic flourishing. When Whitfield preached, he moved around. He waved his arms wildly. He told dramatic stories from the Bible. Um, for example, um, uh, Abraham sacrificing Isaac, and when he told these stories, he played the role of the various characters as if he was like um, uh, a one-man actor, as if he told biblical figures, people would treat him, uh, and he would say like Abraham would do blah, 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 and Isaac said this, and Abraham said this. Think about the story of Abraham killing Isaac, so he – revs up. And people actually know the end of the story. You know, they know how it ends, but yet he's saying, imagine Abraham carrying his precious little boy up to the mountain. And imagine Abraham about to stab his son in the chest with a knife to sacrifice him. And imagine Isaac, no, father, father, don't kill me. Then the Lord stops the hand and says, don't kill the son, you know, kill the ram instead. And that ram actually is Jesus. And Jesus died for you. You should have been the dead one, but Jesus died for you. Just like he's been substituted, you know. And, you know, when, when, you know, it's been said that, you know, when Abraham was, when, when he told the story about Abraham about to kill Isaac, women would scream and men would shout, like, don't do it, don't do it. They were so caught up in the story. Again, they know how it ends. They, they're biblically literate. They know the story. You know, they were so caught up in the story that they, they were horrified. They were so caught up in the drama because it, Whitfield is such a good, incredibly good dramatic actor. Um, <clears throat> people were treated to one-man play and apparently a very good one to that. And again, I, I want you to think about what's going on in early America. No theater, no movies, no phones, no DVDs. I mean, uh, there, there was no playhouse. Um, life was good perhaps, but kind of dull. And Whitfield might have been the traveling circus. He's the best guy in town. He, this is the most entertainment they'll ever get in their lifetime perhaps. Um, Whitfield has critics. I mean, they thought he was not acting properly. His critics said that when talking about the new birth, one joke was he acted like a woman in labor giving birth because he screamed and howled and cried so much while he was preaching. And also he cried during his sermons. Many thought that this was very unmanly and undignified where the pastor, the priest is supposed to be educated, professorial, you know, the most dignified person in town, yet he's flailing his arms, acting all emotional, and this seemed unbecoming. In fact, most people were moved to tears when he preached. He he was um, uh, moved to tears when he preached. Whitfield, when he preached, did not ever preach about doctrine, although he had doctrine, but he never explicitly said, here's theology, here's doctrine. He talked about feelings a lot. Salvation was an issue, not an issue of head knowledge for him. It was about your passions, your feelings. All the dramatic efforts were designed to place you in a position where you were horrific, horrifically disgusted by your own sins. You felt helpless and you feared God. You were terrified of hell. And in the depth of your helplessness and desperation, Jesus offered you with hot what Jesus offered to you. Then with hot tears, you joyfully embrace the offer of Jesus' salvation. But the whole thing is very emotional. I mean, how do you know that you're sinful? Well, you feel it. How do you know that God is calling you? Well, you feel it. How do you know that you're saved? How do you have any kind of assurance of salvation? Well, you, you, you feel it. Notice who's being cut out of the transaction, the local pastors. It's now between you and God directly. You can, me, it used to be me, church and pastor and God. God, church and pastor, me. Now we sort of like bypass the pastor. You're getting around the pastor. You don't actually have to go to, God talks to you directly. Um, Whitfield was America's first great celebrity. He was famous in America for being a great preacher, but he's also getting famous for being famous. Yet people want to get saved. But some people went to see this famous guy that everyone's talking about. Some people went to get entertained for sure. This was a very entertaining theater in America. This was a spectacle. Some actually went just to see this massive crowd they've been hearing about. 
Again, he'll simply draw crowds of 5,000. His large crowds of 15,000. It's said that when he preached in Boston and Boston Commons, um, the, the crowd was so large that he had no amplification, and yet he could actually, everyone could hear him. His voice was amazing. Okay, so Whitfield has a single focus message, the new birth. You must be born again. You must be born again. That's his only message he's delivering over and over again. You must experience a new birth. All the drum, all the tears, all the showmanship serve one purpose. God pe God saved people, and you must be saved. Um, again, and you're going to be saved not because the church says so, right? Not because your pastor says, I agree, you're saved. No, you're saved because you feel it in your intuition. You've got to get saved, and you're going to be the one who tells yourself that you're saved. You're going to feel it. You're the authenticator of your own salvation. However, Whitfield started asking if local pastors were actually saved. Maybe the, pa maybe the pastors, maybe they were just going through the motions. Maybe they weren't saved. Now think about this now, right? This is kind of uh, democratizing. First, it's like, I am saved directly by God. I know I'm saved by me. I don't have to be validated by the pastor. Now Whitfield is saying, I'm not sure your local pastors are being are saved. Now think about this now, right? And Whitfield showed to the town, and he the circus is coming to town. He's preaching in a way you've never preached before. And for the first time in your life, you know, you're 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 being saved as an individual. You think you were saved. And then Whitfield leaves. What's gonna happen when you look at your old priest, your old pastor, and you're like, man, you're boring. You don't preach anything like Whitfield. And then he might start asking the question, how is it I've been in your church my entire life, but I've, I've never been saved before? You know, no, no. Why, why, how did you let me go unsaved? You might be angry at your local pastor, and your local pastor actually might get really angry and threatened by Whitfield. Like, you don't want Whitfield to come to town. In fact, when Whitfield's coming to town, some pastors said, no, don't come, don't come. We don't want you here because you're going to rile things up and preach a weird doctrine that we don't really believe in. If that's the case, right, some people ask Whitfield not to come, but Whitfield came anyway. But where's he going to preach? Will he preach in your pulpit? In other words, people would extend Whitfield the courtesy, preach in my pulpit. People said, no, don't come. So where did Whitfield preach? He preached in the fields, in the open fields. Um, how do you stop that? You know, you don't want Whitfield coming to town, but how do you stop the guy from preaching in the open field? That's really scary. So people would hear Whitfield. They'd abandon their home churches and go hear Whitfield preach in the, in, in the fields. And if that happens, you know, I mean, people are voting with their feet. They're choosing Whitfield. Sounds like, you know, democracy. Again, we don't have the American Revolution yet. We don't have a democracy yet. But it's like we're heading there. We're taking little baby steps towards democracy, towards people voting against their established inherited authorities for an upstart that they choose. That they're, And these authorities, their pastors, don't like Whitfield. People are saying, I don't care if you don't like Whitfield. We're not going to listen to you. We're going to vote for Whitfield. Um. An imitator of Whitfield, because Whitfield spawned a bunch of imitators. People thought, I like this. They have the new birth. Now they want to preach the new birth. A guy named Gilbert Tennant started telling people that if you suspect your pastor is not saved, then you should leave your church and find a pastor who is saved. Gilbert Tennant is saying, not only must you be saved, but your pastor, who's never preached the way before, may not be saved. So go find a pastor who's saved. This was an inverted Jeremiah. For decades, pastors have been telling the Puritans they were not, they were sinful. They were falling short. They are not good enough. Now, Whitfield and Gilbert Tennant are telling the mass of people it was not their fault that they failed, that they're spiritually inadequate. It's your pastors who failed. They failed you. Okay, pastor telling people, Jeremiah, you're not good enough. Now, Whitfield's telling his people, no, no, you go tell your pastor they're not good enough. Again, kind of proto-democracy. We're inching towards the American Revolution un un uh, inadvertently. <coughs> Some pastors heavily criticized Whitfield, but it seems like the more they criticized Whitfield, the more popular Whitfield got and the more it looked like they were unsaved. So Whitfield's saying, your pastor's not saved. And the pastor's saying, I hate Whitfield. It's like, yeah, say you're not saved. That's why I hate Whitfield. It sort of didn't work. It didn't really matter, though, because where Whitfield preached in the streets and people came out. He even preached in the fields. People came out. Preached in giant parks. People came out. Um, when the Enlightenment, while, while the Enlightenment is on our mind, I want to draw a connection. Again, most people think the Enlightenment is about the opposite tendency, Enlightenment is about opposite tendencies in American life. The intellectuals were, were, were modern and deist, and Shirley Johnson Edwards was an intellectual. But the Great Awakening was a movement among the common people. And so you could think of the Great Awakening as a reaction against the Enlightenment. 
perhaps. As I said before, and we'll talk about this more when we get back, I want it because it's a rather complicated idea. I think we have to think of the Great Awakening and the Enlightenment as working parallel with one another. And in fact, I think what happened with the Great Awakening is like a reaction to the Enlightenment. The source of religion is no longer in authority, in the intellectual life, you know, in the established world. So now the source of, and it's a threat. So I think the source of authority now has to be subjective, private, in the heart.